Okay, I want to thank everyone for coming. I'm Julia Wester, and I'm a co-founder of a company called 55 Degrees. You've probably seen our big banners downstairs and everything. But before we get into all of that, I wanted to thank you for coming here today. It's been super great for me to see familiar faces. Honestly, that's one of the things I miss the most about not having in-person conferences, seeing all the people that I already know and love. But we've met a lot of new people, new faces, some of you that now I will miss you between now and the next conference, and it's great to have those faces. I want to talk to you today about how well does your workflow flow? And bonus points if you can come up with a confusing limerick for those words, because that would be fun to have. OK, why do I want to talk to you about that? Well, as I worked through my, uh, my career, which has been sort of just an organic approach. I was a music major, so of course I never made anything with that. So I went into learning how to be a web developer. And from there, I went to managing and then to coaching and consulting. And now I own my own company, right? So it's really important from at every role and at every level to understand uh, how to get work to come out of your system very easily, how to deliver work very easily. And as you ascend in a corporation as you come closer to responsibility for the company and for the people and their welfare, you understand that not only is it important to meet dates, but it's important financially for an organization to be able to reach their goals and to remain viable, to be able to do what you need to do when people need it. Okay, so that's what workflow is all about. And I'm going to jump into that. Even though all of that's important, the reason why I decided to speak to you about this here today is a lot about the conversations that I've had with some of you and other organizations with people like you. One of our um, flagship app, really our flagship app, one of our apps, is Actionable Agile. And Daniel Vicanti is the uh, original creator, original founder of that. And we operate that and we talk to a lot of customers who are in the journey of figuring out how to optimize their flow. And sometimes they really struggle with getting the right flow metrics and working to become predictable because of some design choices in their workflow. So I've been thinking a lot about that, and I've been germinating some thoughts, and some of these thoughts are still in progress, but I've tried to encapsulate a lot of what I've been thinking into an underlying premise, some things I think you might want to stay away from, and some things I think that you can do instead. And it would be great to, after the talk, talk about that some more, continue the conversation on social media. Okay. Before we really get started, let's talk about flow. What is it? It's always good to make sure you're on the same page. Well, if you read the Kanban guide, it has a definition for us. It's the flow, it, flow is the movement of potential value through a process or a system. So, when I say potential, I mean potential. And we talked about our Dan and Pratik talked about this yesterday on Drunk Agile. Before we start something, we really don't know if something's valuable or not. We've ha it has potential value. We have a hypothesis that it has value. And the only way to find out for sure is to move it through the process, turn it into something that can go out there and find out if that value can be realized. OK? So that's what flow means. And the workflow is the model of that system that the work moves through. Okay, so when we optimize flow, we optimize the movement of work through that model. This is a really good way to look at it at any level of the organization, but especially if you're talking to directors and executives and finance people and all of that, we can look at our workflow in a financial model. If you think about when you start putting effort or investment into a work, before that, it's simply an option. You haven't, you know, no pain, no loss, right? You haven't done anything yet, so not doing it may or may not cost you anything, right? You haven't put any money out. But once you start the work and until you finish it, you're paying either in time or in money to work on that item in the hopes that it will return some value once it crosses the finish line and hopefully becomes an asset. Okay? So if we think about flow and how work moves through our process, what we're really trying to say when we say optimize flow is to minimize our liabilities, to have as few liabilities as possible as it makes sense, 
and to get them through our process as quickly as possible in as friction-free a way as possible, right? And hopefully remove some stress along the way. <clears throat> so how do you know if you have a workflow that's optimized? Well, I sort of posit the one signal that maybe can tell you is how it looks like when work is moving through your workflow. Because when I think of smooth, optimized flow, I have a picture in my mind of work sort of entering, having a nice, pleasant, smooth journey from beginning to end straight through our workflow. I don't know how many of you feel like that's the experience of your work items. Enters, and it's just sort of friction-free all the way to paradise. <laughs> I see no hands, right? <laughs> Okay, most of us have some flow that looks like this. We have just a bunch of erratic movement back, forth, up, down, just all the way around, right? And it's really difficult to know what to do with that, right? We want to turn that into just like sort of an arrow moving across. Now, here's the thing that I, is my thought in progress, and I've been testing it out with people like Pratik and Dan and other people. I think that when columns reflect stages of a life cycle, if you think of that journey of a piece of work from, as, from uh, option through liability to asset, if I could look at that as here are the phases of learning about that work, about it growing in value to the point where we can release it and get, get return back on that investment. If I model my workflow after that journey, then there's something that we can use our workflow for, and the position of the work in that workflow, we can get a signal from that. <coughs> what I mean from that is, if an item is in a particular column, and it moves to the right, it moves closer towards finish, if our workflow is modeled after that journey to value, then I know as it moves closer to the finish, I'm also moving closer to being able to realize that value. So if I, in, on the opposite side, if I have a work item and it moves to the left, it moves backwards, then that ideally is a signal that we've regressed in our journey towards value, that we weren't as near as we thought we were, so we're correcting that signal. And now I can look at my board, I can look at my workflow, and I can see just by their position how close in the life cycle are all of these individual things to being able to realize the value out of our investment. Okay, so that makes sense? Yes. Okay. Now, so this is the underlying thing I want to get people to start embracing and thinking about when they make workflow designs, when they build out their systems. So how does this connect to optimizing flow? I was talking about this a little bit earlier, and as I'm still sort of gelling about this, um, the best way I can think about to describe why this is important is that we said flow is the movement of work, um, a potential value through a system, right? to get to the point where we can actually get some return on that investment. If we don't make the workflow, which is our model of that system, if it re doesn't reflect that journey, if it reflects something else, and we optimize that something else, it may or may not improve our journey to value delivery. So if we make the model reflect what we're trying to optimize for, we have a much better chance of optimizing for the thing that we want. Okay. So there are a few common signals. In fact, there's, there's a lot, but I've picked out three common workflow choices that I think block our ability to use the position in the workflow to give us a signal of position relative to getting a return on our investment. So I want to talk about those, and these are from our customers, from our own internal experience, because we're a team. We might work on flow tools, right? We might be telling you all the things that are helping you to do better, but we're people just like you. We still struggle with doing all the things we're talking about, and so we have empathy in the situations that you're dealing with, and so I'll share one of those stories as we go through. So we're gonna talk about those choices and maybe some alternative suggestions for how you can you know, get what you need but have the ability to preserve the signals. Now, <clears throat> the first and maybe most common thing that I see 
is when the columns in our workflow, and I'm going to use columns and workflow stages and, and whatnot sort of synonymously. So when the columns in our workflow, the representation of our process, closely match the functions of the people in our team, what we've done is not build a workflow that is about the journey of work through to get to value. It's really about people and the roles that we have in our organization. We've modeled our organization, not the life cycle journey. And we've created a people flow, not a workflow, right? We don't need to optimize for people flow as much, right? Um, one way to know if you have a workflow that optimizes for people, if you have a people flow instead of a workflow, is to ask the people on your team, ask individuals, where do you work on the board, right? And if they say, well, all my work is always in this one column, and you hear that over and over, then it's likely you've built a model that represents your organization and not the journey to value, okay? Now, what happens when you do that? What are, what are the downsides, right? There's, there's a couple. One, it, you know, if you have a tester, let's say, a, you know, all judgment on this aside of whether you should do this or not. But if you have a test column, and then they say, I tested something and I found a bug, right? Well, now it's got to go to a developer because development is needed. So I need to move it back because there's a column called development, right? We're moving work to people, right? And that signal no longer can tell us how close that work is to being able to realize value or not. We've chosen to optimize for ease of knowing where my work is and ease of you know, making sure we can keep people busy all the time, resource efficiency, which is an important thing to care about. We shouldn't dismiss it completely. But there are other ways that we can control that, that we can manage resource efficiency that don't take away our ability to use the signal of the work and its journey to value. The other problem with this is that when you habitually work in a single position on the board, you generally don't look anywhere else, right? You have blinders on. And then if you are only always working in the development column, for instance, you stop caring about what's happening elsewhere in the board and you become a collection of individuals working on their own stuff and you slowly move away from being a team that's working together towards a common goal. So what I suggest that maybe we do instead is have people work across the entire board, right? Yes, it makes it a little messier because I no longer have my tiny little inbox that I can just focus there and not see all the other drama. But there's a benefit to seeing everything and knowing where you fit into the everything. Instead of optimizing for having the right amount of work for you, we can optimize your contribution to getting work through to being able to realize that value to minimize our liabilities. The other thing is that it builds, or it may not build it proactively, but it removes a barrier to sharing collective responsibility of the work all the way through. Just changing this won't mean that you suddenly have collective responsibility, right? But it sure does make it a lot easier when you see everything that's going on and you know how you're contributing to it. Now, the right names on your columns, what you choose to name them, make that choice to be collectively responsible for the work all the way through and to work in multiple areas of your workflow, it makes it a lot easier if those names aren't so closely tied to functional roles, right? If I see, uh, if I see a column called analysis and my role is something analyst, I'm going to naturally gravitate to wanting my work to be in there. It's just a little psychological trick like, and maybe you might think, oh, that's semantics. But if we can make it just a little bit easier to do the right thing, and this isn't a super hard thing that we do, right? Then we should take that little effort to make that a little bit easier for everyone in the future to do the right thing. Now, related, but slightly different, they're related in the fact that they both cause erratic movement that takes us away from being able to use its position as a signal to being close to value or away from it, is the fact that we need to recognize that cyclical activities happen in a process, right? 
I, I hate to harp on the whole dev test thing, but it's what's in my face all the time. I know that there are probably things like with marketing, you have someone's creating a campaign and then someone's reviewing it or approving it. I know there's a fix. We got to move back to the person that's doing the campaign and you know, you're writing, you have copy edit and all. I mean, the, the parallels are endless. But again, if I look at this whole sort of thing, like I know when we test something, we might find a problem. I mean, that's going to happen sometimes. I need to accept the reality and build a workflow that expects that, right? So in other words, I don't want to plan to have to move my work backwards in my workflow from day one. Instead, what I want to do is I want to build in a workflow that anticipates that cyclical things happen. And I want to identify these stages as, in this stage, we're going to find and fix things here, right? What that does is that gives me a little more visibility. It gives me more data. It lets me say, oh, this is how long we spent in this develop or you know, create portion of our life cycle. And we thought it had graduated to you know, being nearer to turning into value. And so it's now in this validation life cycle. And while it's there, we're going to find and fix things just because we have a little stumbling block doesn't necessarily mean that I've regressed on that journey. I mean, if, <laughs> if you never thought you would find things when you test or validate, then why are we doing it in the first place, right? We expect these things to happen. Now, I mean, that's all Pollyanna and everything, but not everyone wants to do that because I've heard a few things like, well, I would like to know how long we spend in the initial testing so that my testers don't get told they take too long, right? And then I want to know how long we spend in fixing after that initial testing. That's okay. You can do that too, right? You can say, okay, I'm moving from getting it ready for this validation phase, then it goes into someone actively doing the first set of validation, and then we realize there's fixes, right? So now we can move forward into a fixing cycle. Right? So we can see not only how long did it take to do the original getting it ready, we can see how long it took to do the original verification, and then we can see how long it took to do the whole cycle of fixing it if it didn't go straight through. Right? Now, I tried this with my development team, <laughs> and they wanted to have their cake and eat it too just a little bit. So normally when you're looking at uh, this sort of cycle. If you make yourself have two columns, like um, my dev team, they wanted to know in that fixed cycle what was being reviewed and what was needing work, right? So they wanted sort of a sub-column situation of that fixed cycle. So what we did was we had a, in our validating area, we broke it out into reviewing and staging. So when something was in that column, it was a signal that, hey, dude, check it again, you know, right? It, it's, it's ready for you to verify again. And then if I found a problem, it would go over here to fixing again, like, hey, no, that wasn't right. Do it again. And we'd move back and forth and back and forth, right? That breaks my pattern of being able to see the movement for the signal, right? But what I can do in that situation is because those are right next to each other and they represent sort of sub-phases. When I go to measure how work moves through, I just roll those two columns up into one phase, one cycle, right? And I measure all of that as validating. So I'm sort of finding a way to give people some of that granular visibility they want, but from understanding how work flows and doing flow metrics, I haven't given away you know, anything that's going to hurt me and be able to keep me from seeing the signal. So in that case, um, when I look at position relative to the end state, the value, those two columns I treat equally. They're equally far away from value. Now, because at this point, we're really starting to get into the idea of granular activities, and that can really lead us astray when we're thinking about all of the little things that we need to do in our workflow, right? Um, you could go down the road of building a column for every single activity in the world that you ever have to do. In fact, I've taught people how to design workflows and the way I was originally taught to do that 
was, I'm a piece of work. Think of yourself as the piece of work. Now, what happens to me as I move from not started to finish? And when you say what happens to me, because words lead you in a direction, right? When you say what happens to me, I immediately go to activities, right? And well, this happens to me and that happens to me. And if I don't know better, I'll end up with a, you know, a 50 column Kanban board. And then I'll have a bunch of erratic movement because again, some of those activities, are, they're not linear, right? So instead what we do is we look at these activities and we group them together and to say, well, in the first phase of the life cycle, say the infancy, you know, what has to be finished in order for this thing to graduate to toddlerhood, right? What has to be finished for this thing to graduate to adolescence, to adulthood, to senior citizen, to celebration, we can test value now, right? Okay, so we can use these things to avoid the feeling of needing that extra granularity, but yet we can keep track of what needs to happen. And Pratik will tell you that a lot of people will say, um, having exit criteria like this or things like that make it feel like things can't move forward unless everything in this column is done. Well, on the board, they can't move forward, but it doesn't mean that just because an item is still in building, that you can't get started on things for prepping for release or whatever. It's, it's not a barrier, right, for you to look ahead and to work ahead. The item just hasn't graduated to that part of the life cycle yet. There's still things to do here. But I don't know, in an adolescent, some people learn adult things a little earlier, right? We don't stop them and say, no, you're not 18, so you can't learn that yet. Can't do that yet, right? So our work is sort of the same way. Now, the last thing is that, that I want to share today is that when we put columns in that don't have anything to do with the life cycle at all, right, that really throws a wrench into being able to measure flow through a system. And one of the biggest issues or the biggest occurrences of this is the beloved blocked or on hold column, right? Now, I totally get why we want this column because you have a lot of work on your board and if you had to sit there and keep all your blocked items in your column, it's too much clutter and your brain is crazy and you can't focus. So I'm going to move it over here to this blocked column. Get it out of my way so I can see. Right? That's usually why people want to do a blocked column. Well, that's really not the intent of a Kanban system. To make your life easier, to let you get away from reality and focus on something that's just a portion of it and ignore all the rest. Right? The point of a system that helps you improve flow is to see the problem, to experience the problem, actually to feel a little bit of the pain so you'll do something to fix it, right? Moving it over to a blocked column is like turning off a test that fails because it fails, right? That's not the point of testing. I mean, why'd you build a test if we're just going to turn it off when it fails? We need to fix the problem. Now, the reason why I say that, the reason why I feel that way is because if I'm thinking that this process, this workflow, is representing the life cycle of a piece of work, where does blocked fit in the life cycle? Does it come after doing? Does it come after testing? Right? It's not an actual stage in the life cycle. It's a transient aspect of a piece of work that's moving through the life cycle. Right? So what we need to do instead is we need to block the item wherever it is, because now we can track how long it was in doing, how long it was there without being blocked, how long it was blocked there. And we have a lot more visibility. And we can still use its position as a signal to nearness to flow, a nearness to value. Now, you have other options, too, from blocking it in place. You can certainly move it. But better places to move it are to say, you know, this is blocked. It's going to sit here for a while. By the time we get started again, it'll be like we have to start over anyway. So I'm going to move it back and pretty much consider this not started. Just basically wipe the slate clean, right? You can also choose to say, well, crap. This one is pretty much canceled right now. We don't need to do this. We can't do this. So we're going to move it to done, call it canceled. We can separate that out from our actually done work in our metrics, and we can see all of those situations in our data. We haven't ruined our ability to see that. Handoffs are very similar in that if you're going to use them as a column, 
and you want the signal of nearness to value, you have to know where they fit in the workflow. And then when it comes back, ideally it moves to the right, right? You send it off so something could be done to progress you towards finishing it. So when it comes back, you should expect to be closer to finishing it. And then you can move forward to getting that done. So we need the movement and the workflow to model that. So those are three of mine and Margot's favorite uh, situations that we talk to customers about. There are many, many more, so I invite you to share not only your ideas of missteps that keep people from seeing the signal and your tips to avoid them. So you can use the Lean Agile London hashtag. I, I made up one that was too long but sounded fun, 55 degrees of flow, because 55 degrees is my company. So you can use that one, and it can get us started on some conversations. But I want to say, if you only remember one thing, please take this away, because you can use this as a decision filter even if you don't remember any of my suggestions, you might get to them on your own anyway, or get to better ones. Model your workflow so that how you move gives you a signal of getting closer to or farther away from being able to realize that potential value that you hope that your work has. So I want to say thank you for listening to all this. I know you're super tired. It's the end of day two. Um, I don't know how much time we have. Are we five minutes? OK, great. I wanted to open it and see, are there any questions that I can answer for you? Any disagreements or any, anything else that you want to share? Now's the time. Will. Uh, I can Microphone is coming. Well, I can project. Yes, you can. Hey, Julia. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering for teams that are more in a service industry and not necessarily a product industry where they might support multiple forms of value, say, for instance, an HR team, mm -hmm. um, right? Is there, how would you deal with that if there are many different kinds of value that flow through that team? And, and how do you prevent this from becoming so abstract that it loses meaning for a team? Yeah, I mean, you can have different models, different workflows that represent different paths to value on a Kanban board. Maybe some tools make it harder, but if, if you think about what you should be able to do, you don't have to force every bit of work into one, one system, one journey to value. So I would encourage you to map the different paths to value and then put the work that it represents through those and then figure out the tooling issues related to that. I know in JIRA, it looks like uh, everyone, you know, their visualization for Kanban, not great. Sorry, I mean, I'm a JIRA app vendor, so, you know, um, I'll be the first to admit that it looks like there's one workflow. They make you sort of abstract it up, but there are multiple workflows that flow through those seemingly same columns. Um, so it's all a matter of coming to an understanding of how you know what those mean for the different workflows if you're forced to do that. Some tools let you actually see the different workflows in their tool. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yep. We have one back there. So I accepted your challenge and wrote a limerick about workflows. <laughs> awesome. Um, right. For corporations, their workflows ain't fun. They mix up swim lanes and columns. <laughs> they don't measure whip, block columns seem hip, and there's no agreed definition of done. Oh, that's awesome. Woo! <laughs> I think that was better than my talk, so go here. <laughs> I'm prepared to share the glory. Yes, please, please share that. That's awesome. Any other questions that I can answer for you or any other comments? JP has a question. <laughs> Hustle. So you talked about people flow and uh, workflow. Um, how is that any different when we're actually abstracting things down to a team layer rather than across the organizational layer? Because there's stuff happening upstream and stuff happening downstream. Yeah. If you're saying people should work across the whole board, are you, if you kind of, well, for me, when I'm thinking about it, then should you even have a team board in the first place when you've got people who are in larger groups collaborating? 
Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I'm going to think about that for a second. But I don't think that when I say avoid having your team board uh, essentially be just a column per person, I don't think that's the same as not needing a team board at all. Because the work that moves through that team is there's a process that when it gets to that part of the overall value stream, it's like zooming in and seeing that part of the process in more detail and optimizing the flow through that, but realizing that that's not the only part of that larger stream. So we care about it at all those levels, right? So yes, I would say that these same things apply at a team level. Um, and then when you back up to looking at things like epics or projects or whatever on a portfolio Kanban, Again, you, I, the signal that you want to see, regardless of what kind of work through, workflow it has, is if I'm moving towards what says done over here, am I actually getting closer to done? Or am I, if I move left, am I getting closer to start? Like That's what it should signal, but have you built your workflow in a way that that's actually true? right? So for me, it's more about does the movement left or right actually tell you I'm getting closer or farther away from done? Or do I just have weirdness in here that makes you move all which way? And I don't get that signal at all because what we can do in that signal is we can start saying from here, it usually takes this long to be done, right? But when you have here and then you go back here and that way in every way, it's often much more difficult to allow us to do that kind of forecasting or to have a better understanding of what happens in our workflow. So we're actually just trying to simplify in a way. And I think that should scale, but I need to think about that some more. Yeah, thanks. Thanks everyone for coming. I know you're probably super tired, but I really appreciate it.